Yeah, welcome to Think Tech on a given Thursday. I'm Jay Fidel, the handsome young man is Tom Yamachika. Uh, we're here today for um, Talking Tax with Tom. And the title of our discussion this morning is More Tax Laws to the Governor. And what's interesting, without getting even to the detail of that, is didn't we have a, a kind of a surplus this this session, Tom? Why do we, oh, need, yes. why do we need tax laws? Well, um, some actually go in the right direction to, to give relief to taxpayers. We were talking last week about giving the rebate uh, to taxpayers, you know, the $300 per, per exemption, and uh, to lessen some of the GE taxes on uh, nonprofit fundraising and also uh, in the sh uh, shipping industry. So some of these are going in the right direction. Maybe, okay, maybe well, they'll be signed. Maybe they'll be signed. At least they got that far. Let's let's go down the list that you you made. Uh, yeah, here, this this week, is a list of questionable bills. Yeah, this this week we're going uh, over the bills who make you want to go hmm <laughs> because some of these are, are are very interesting. The first bill uh, is sponsored by our Department of Accounting and General Services. This is Senate Bill three zero four zero, and what it does is it basically says they can they can. Um, uh, buy a new purchasing system, you know, a big software upgrade, five, six million dollar uh, beast, uh, but, the, but it'll be paid by user fees and the user fees are going to be paid by whoever uh, the state uh, purchases goods or services from. Um, so uh, basically, you get taxed when you sell to the state. Yeah, that does sound like a tax. Isn't that a tax? Uh, to me, it sounds like a tax. <laughs> to them, it's oh, it's just, it's just a user fee, because we have a uh, you know a, a a special little contrivance that we're you know building and uh, we're we're you know just making people pay for it. Um, but uh, problem number one is it doesn't exist yet. Number two um, uh, is we're already you know we're already charging people tax for you know uh, sales to and from the government, and this is going to be something else on top of it. Well, the other thing that strikes me, and you can comment, is uh, gee whiz, you know, it's hard to do business with the state in this state. There's a lot of bureaucracy. <clears throat> some some businesses will not do business with the state. They won't lease them office space or land. Uh, they won't uh, sell them things. It's too it's too much trouble to get paid. You have to go around the bush on every transaction. You run into these uh, um, bureaucratic issues. Am I right? And uh, this is now this is a further impediment, isn't it? Not not so much a further impediment is you know open up your wallet and we'll take some more money from you. That's nice. Yeah, isn't that nice for the privilege for the privilege of getting paid by the government for services that you provided them? Right, in, provided in a them. bureaucratic setting where you may not even want to do business with them anyway. Right. If they're trying to incentivize you to do business with them, this is not one way to do it. The other thing is they don't need the money, as I mentioned, do they? Uh, I think that this you know money for the this new computer system should come from general fund. It benefits all of government. I would add one to that and say it should have come from general fund a long time ago. It would have, yeah. <laughs> I, I definitely don't disagree with that. <laughs> I mean, Neil definitely. Abercrombie was talking about how he was going to remake the computer system in the state because Sonny Bagualia, you know, the fellow they hired to evaluate the state of affairs in the computer system had found that it was behind the curve by decades. And uh, Neil, Neil said, oh, we got to fix that. He never did, unfortunately. And even till now, it's behind the curve. Oh, of course it is. Okay, ready anyway. Go, ready to go to the next bill? Yep. Okay. Uh, oh, by the way, uh, 3040, it's, you know, the probability of it's, if it's going to be signed is close to 100% because it was sponsored by the governor's department so uh, when it goes up to the governor to sign, he's going to do it. Mm. He's going to do it. Mm. Okay. The second bill, House Bill 2179, comes from the Department of Taxation. It's sponsored by them. And what it says uh, is that it allows the department to convert tax liens into civil judgments if 365 days pass from the date of recording with no response or action by the taxpayer. Okay, so why do they want to do this? 
because you know you and I, other people who have practiced in litigation before, know that the judgment comes first, the lien comes later, right? You get the judgment first, and then you record against you know specific assets that the taxpayer may have. Yeah, right. Yeah. So this is backwards. So why is it backwards? Because there is a 15-year statute of limitations on collection action by the Department of Taxation. And the 15 years has started to bite because that legislation was signed into law 15 years ago or almost 15 years ago. So they're trying to find an end run around it. And here, and here it is. Judgments have an independent 10-year life from when they're entered. And they can be extended for another 10 years. So you have a 15-year collection statute of limitations that is basically being extended to 35 years. I'm sure the, you know, the uh, sponsor of the original legislation to put a, a collection statute of limitations in the department in the first place is probably rolling around and, and going nuts because that's the effect of this bill. Now, um, and you know, it also has some practical problems. For example, if you petition the court to enter a civil judgment, the court's going to want you to serve the taxpayer. And uh, if we're talking about a taxpayer who has never um, re responded or, or, or acted, uh, you know, with respect to the department for, you know, more than a year, you think the taxpayer is still around? That'd be highly unlikely. So how are you going to serve the how are you going to serve the taxpayer to get this civil judgment? Maybe, maybe uh, what they're going to want is something that says you can get a judgment without serving the taxpayer, or you serve the taxpayer by publication, uh, which which makes it even more and more questionable. Service by publication, by the way, uh, is a means by which um, you publish the taxpayer's uh, name in the paper, and um, uh, that gives the court enough jurisdiction to say, okay, well, the taxpayer should know about it now, so we'll, we'll go ahead and proceed against him anyway. I'm, I'm troubled uh, on both sides of this. Um, number one is that I always wondered, Tom, why, you, why there was a limit on it, why you had to renew uh, a judgment in the first place, uh, or for that matter, a land. Um, well, why doesn't it just go on in perpetuity? Well, I mean, uh, there there are purposes for any statute of limitations. Most, uh, you know, the ones that are cited most often are, you know, people forget about stuff. Uh, records get old. Some 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 tend to disappear. Uh, they they can get destroyed by you know fire, flood, or whatever. Um, and uh, you know, and, and and people forget about things if it's if it's you know old and older and older. Yeah, but you want <clears throat> okay. I, I mean, I'll take the devil's advocate on this, although I this is not my my favorite position. But uh, okay, there's there's no question that the money is owed, no question. Yeah, and and the land tends to um, you know drive the debtor out of out of the shadows and force him to come to you. If, for example, he can't sell property, you know, the land um, you know uh, affects his his property or his business. He's going to have to come to you and make a deal, pay you off somehow. Yeah, but that apparently about... hasn't worked for the first fifteen years. Well, I, I yes, I guess that's true. And and is that because uh, the government isn't doing something it should have been doing over the fifteen years? Well, you you wonder about that. I mean, but but the the practical reality is, uh, you know, each of these poor collectors has a has a caseload of three or four thousand. So how can they possibly keep track of, you know, that many people and, and, and assets or lack thereof? Um, you know, some people move away. I think a lot of them do. Mm -hmm. or, or, or some people uh, are incapacitated for other reasons, like, you know, like they die. I recall it to be like fishing, you know. Uh, in other words, you, let, you, 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 you drop the land, like dropping the line. <laughs> you drop the land out there in the water. And after a while, this guy gets into a mousetrap where he buys property, not realizing that as soon as he takes title, bingo, 
there's a lien on it and he can't you know sell it or mortgage it or anything until he clears the lien and so you may not you know have recovery in each case in which there is a lien on some taxpayer but once in a while you score 100 percent, right yeah yep absolutely so i mean that they're playing a game of odds on that one on the 15 15 years um so yeah but, but still, right. still 15 years is a long time even the government gives up after 10. i mean the federal government yeah they 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 have a statute of limitations on collection of 10 years why, why are we longer because it used to be forever and uh uh and and, and taxpayers thought well we'll, we'll we'll experiment with 15 years and see what happens okay one last question and that is all right so it is backward but i suppose they could take the land, which has not been reduced to a full, a full, a full rights, uh, a full empowered judgment yet. It's a, only a land on property, and and the powers of uh, enforcement are limited because it's only a, a land on property. So now the government wants to make it a, a full tilt judgment uh, and use other, you know, uh, uh, other remedies to collect it. Okay, but they don't have to. Well, they don't have to because theoretically they don't want to let it die. So they make no, because, because after the tax is assessed, you have all kinds of collection tools already available. You can go levy somebody's bank account. You can you can record a lien uh, on on property even if you don't know what the property is. Okay, um, you can you can distrain taxpayers' property if you find property. Okay, you can do all of this with the assessment. You don't need the judgment. So what's the point? The point is to get around the statute of limitations on collection. So why not just point. increase the 15 years to 35? I, I don't know. I mean, that's one of the things that makes me want to go, hmm, about this bill, because, it, you know, the, 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 uh, when, you, when you kind of look at it, it's really, you know, something is being gamed, okay? There is an element of dishonesty in this bill. It's not forthright, okay? They're doing this because they want to game the taxpayers. Yeah. Well, it's going to cost them some money because they're going to have to, you know, if there's just let the land stay in place, that's one thing. It doesn't cost them anything. I mean, if, if, the, if it was, uh, say, 20 or 30 years instead of 15, but <clears throat> it's going to cost them some money to go and publish. In other words, uh, you, you and I know that publishing a summons ain't cheap. You have to go into a newspaper of general circulation publish it for X days, weeks, months, whatever it is, uh, and you have to pay the bill for that. And if you're fishing with, um, you know, with, with a, a, a limited prospect of actual success, uh, you've just spent money for no good reason. Yeah, so I think the next thing they're going to do is they're going to um, uh, do a, a bill that says oh, service includes uh, publishing the name on the department's website, which is something they've already done. Okay, for uh, GE license abandonment. Gee, okay. that has that has a Fourteenth Amendment uh, issue, doesn't it? I mean, that's is that due process? That's uh, not been tested yet. Hmm. I mean, you could you know drop it in the back of uh, some publication that nobody in the world reads and say, "Oh, bingo, we got you." Um, that doesn't sound like it comes anywhere close to actual notice or even. Um, you know, reasonable constructive notice. Yeah, that's 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 a problem we had with it. We testified uh, to that effect, uh, but you know, to no avail. Again, this is a this is a uh, an administration bill sponsored by the Department of Taxation. So, the chances of the governor signing it are you know probably a hundred percent or close to it. So what you know, I know we have other bills to discuss, but let me ask you: what, Can we get a kind of a handle on the character of this session? on the character of where the legislature is vis-a-vis -vis taxpayers uh, from looking at bills like this? Well, um, the, these, these bills are the outliers, okay? Mo um, usually you have a session with a lot worse stuff going on, like tax rates being increased or fees being increased or you know combinations of the above. Uh, this year, it's more about giving back to the taxpayers, prob probably because there's an election going on this year. And and each and every one of the people in the capital is, uh, you know, is facing the reality of that fact that they are facing the voters in this November and possibly before. Hmm. Okay, I guess uh, then the question is, uh, if that's all true, we have a, a 
a surplus which we're doling out in in swatches of hundreds of millions and we have an election year nobody wants to offend anybody why are we having bills like this that are really questionable uh because they think they'll still they'll, they'll squeak by and nobody will notice do they know do the do the administration administration agencies you know the departments who suggested these bills uh, do they and the attorney general and the governor do they know that they're questionable of course they do people not only not only the tax foundation but others have been testifying to that effect all you know all through the process hmm. well <clears throat> squeak through this is the squeak through theory thank you for that uh, right. let's go let's go on to the next one <clears throat> House Bill 137 is a 2021 bill that got dusted off this session. It deals with the County Liquor Commission and its powers to investigate liquor licensees. So right now the law says uh, that if a liquor in, a commission investigator finds out the liquor tax hasn't been paid, you know, if, 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 if there's like cash transactions or stuff like that, uh, then the investigator has, you know, the, the power and the duty to rat them out uh, to the Department of Taxation. Uh, this bill would break that cooperation and say basically uh, the Department of Taxation would need to use its own investigative resources, period, to, to root out liquor tax scoff laws. So that means uh, we're going to have some Department of Taxation uh, investigators being sent to local bars and probably buying drinks at taxpayer expense to figure out whether they're paying the proper taxes. Who would, who would propose such a bill? It's a backward step, isn't it? The Honolulu Liquor Commission did. And why? Is there some political reason? It sounds like there is. It sounds like this is a political bill um, and that the, um, you know, those who would call for a bill like this do not have the public interest in mind. Uh, that's that's what I think. I mean, it was you know pushed very heavily uh, by the uh, the city liquor control administrator. Uh, one of the uh, you know supervising staff, you know the, one of the supervising investigators, wrote testimony against the bill, which means that they don't think you know uh, uh, something's entirely correct with what's uh, what's with what's being proposed, and and we agree. Um, number one, the department needs all the help it can get in terms of enforcing the law. And if, you know, uh, uh, law enforcement officer A finds something wrong, uh, why, do, why do they have to silo themselves? Why can't they, you know, bring whatever, you know, is, is found uh, to the particular agency for, for follow-up? Yeah, there's something hanging out in public here. This is really strange. Because I, and let me, let me uh, tell you how I understand it. You can tell me if I'm right. Um, this hampers uh, the effect of the, the, uh, the, the uh, enforcement uh, possibilities by the Department of Taxation. It allows those enforcement possibilities to stay in this silo with the Liquor Commission. If the, the Liquor Commission is somehow compromised on a given case, then the Department of Taxation never finds out about it. And the tax is essentially written off, forgiven, um, and, well, and and or it's that, never found out about. Yeah, never found out about. So if if the liquor commission goes soft, uh, the taxpayers, I mean you and me, uh, have have a, have a negative result um, because it's hidden. It can be hidden this way, and so this all relies on the um, you know the uh, enforcement capabilities of the liquor commission, which are questionable. Yeah. Now. Uh, during the testimony on this bill, there was a lot of discussion about, well, you know, Liquor Commission uh, investigators are requiring applicants to give tax return information. And we don't think that's right. And, 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 I, and I look at the bill and go, this bill has nothing to do with that. Nothing. But, so, I mean, it doesn't say that. It doesn't say that at all. Did anybody catch him on that? Well, uh, I, among others, you know, said it at, 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 at you know, various legislative hearings. Wow. So who, so it sounds like you guys were opposing the bill. Who, who was, um, who was supporting the bill? Like I said, the, the primary proponent was the Liquor Commission Administrator. 
This is very fishy, Bill. Don't you think? Makes me want to go. Mm. Yeah. Interesting. Well, it'll squeak through. Uh, be, why? Because it's the Liquor Commission speaking to the governor? Is that what will happen here? Maybe. Well, you think it has less of a chance to squeak through as the, uh, uh, what, uh, 3040 or 2179? Yeah, I mean, I think so. I mean, um, you know, 3040 and 2179 are the governor's own agencies, right? I mean, this is not. Yeah. You know, this is a city agency. So, you know, it's it's, you know, a fellow government, but you know, that only goes so far. In a larger, a larger sense, though, it seems to me that you want government agencies to cooperate with each other. I mean, this of course you it, do. Yeah. It, it come up with Merrick Garland asking for the transcripts of the select committee on the insurrection, you know, there being some resistance on that for reasons I think that will disappear. Um, but the bottom line is you want government agencies to be efficient. You want them to collaborate. Yeah. What's, the, what's the downside? Here's the question. What is the downside of collaborating? You got me. I mean, I think that if we're, you know, if we're paying folks to go investigate this stuff, I mean, the investigation results should be available to everybody. Right. Otherwise, otherwise, you're having a duplication of effort, aren't you? You have yeah. two people investigating, ostensibly, theoretically investigating the exact same issue. So I pay at the liquor commission expense. guy at, right, and the tax office at taxpayer expense. Yeah. What's wrong with that picture? What's wrong with that picture? Well, good for you for going in and speaking on it, but uh, I would really hate to see this pass over your objection. Well, um, we shall see. Uh, we have a we have a couple more months to wait, and then we'll find out. Yeah. Okay. And last well, and last but not least, there's Senate Bill two three seven nine, which allows the Department of Taxation Special Enforcement Section to examine any sector of the state's economy, initiate civil investigations, and use enforcement and education to deter taxpayer noncompliance. Okay, they can do that anyway. They're part of the Department of Taxation. It's part of their mission. Why are we are we you know doing this bill? Answer: Because the Special Enforcement Section can tap into the Tax Administration Special Fund. Okay, so that so it gives them an additional way to use the slush fund money. It's Why the Director of Taxation just? Do that with a stroke of a pen. Apparently, it's a little bit more difficult than that. That's why he wants this bill. He, the, the, the department's supporting the bill. The department's, uh, I, I, it's, it's not an officially sponsored bill, uh, but the department is supporting it. So you, call it, strong support. you, know, you consider it questionable because they may not even actually need it or they, it's it's not telling us why. Uh, it's a budgetary artifice. Yeah. This this bill is a budgetary artifice. It's it's I think only salient purpose is to get uh, the tax administration special fund um, more you know uh, more use and in use and mobilized uh, by this special enforcement section, which is already legislatively authorized to use the special fund. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. Aside from the, the funding issue and uh, the, um, you know, ostensible purpose of this bill, what about that? I mean, you've been watching this for years. I mean, does, does, the, tax, does the tax office actually engage in this kind of investigation? Uh, is it helpful? Oh, yeah. Is it useful? Is it worth the money? Well, it, they, they, they engage in this investigation, of course, and of course it's useful. <clears throat> You know, to bring uh, tax scoff laws to the light of day, um, but but really, what's happening <coughs> is, hey, other departments have special funds. Why can't we? Okay, we have this tax administration special fund. It 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 used to be, you know, uh, just just a few, you know, just a few hundred thousand dollars. It pays a few uh, attorneys to, to investigate QHTB applications and review them. Uh, and that that was fine. Now, now now it's ten million dollar juggernaut. Okay, last year, last year alone, the legislature raided that special fund for I believe fifteen million dollars because it found that there was fifteen million dollars 
in excess of the requirements of such fund. Mm. You, you oppose this bill. We, we don't uh, support or oppose anything. We just provide comments. And your comments were they, to put it in um, the context of a questionable bill? Uh, I suppose you could say that, yeah. Well, let's talk about special funds. You know, you know, if you ask the man on the street, what is this with special funds? He really wouldn't know why the state of Hawaii government has special funds. Little pockets, uh, little silos of money, hither and yon, um, not controlled by any one source, uh, controlled by a, a multiple number of sources. It's like when you have, it's controlled uh, with the department uh, with the department. It's controlled by the department to which they're attached. Okay, you know, it's not controlled. By the, it's a, the, the, the way it's supposed to work hmm. is the legislature has purse strings. And they're there for a reason. And the reason is so that the legislators uh, representatives of the people can go review the activities of each and every executive department and you know, evaluate the merit of what they've done and say, okay, you've done a good job, here's some more money. Or, yeah, this program isn't doing what it's supposed to, let's cut it off. That's what they're supposed to do. But, but special funds are a huge hindrance on that objective because it allows you know, a, a program, no matter how inefficient, to proceed anyway, because the, because the legislatures aren't controlling it. Yeah, so they're not doing what they should be, what we, we expect them to do, and and we're leaving this discretion in the hands of um, the the departments themselves, the leader of the department. Yeah, so um, like putting, I, I think, it's like you, putting the the the, heck, the 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 hen house in charge of the fox, right? Yeah, but there's another thing too, is that you leave the money in there. I mean, this is Linda Lingle complained about this, not that she was right or wrong. I'm not saying that, but she did complain about it. And, and what she said was, uh, if you have all these special funds around, you're leaving hundreds of millions of dollars dormant, not available. So if it's stuck in one fund, it can't be used by the other fund. And so we have a, a huge inefficiency across the, the, the landscape of the government. Yeah, that's, stuck, a, that's stuck absolutely here, true. Came, so you have one department that's long for you know, crazy reasons. You have another department that's short for crazy reasons, and there's no easy way to equalize it. That's right. The way you equalize it is by rating the funds, which is what happened last year. How do you do that? You pass a law. Oh, okay. So that doesn't sound very constructive to me. Why, why can't it be in the general fund, all of it? I guess you've yeah. already answered. Yeah, that. I mean, that's, that's what you know, Governor Ben's philosophy was, you know, Ben Cayetano. He says, you know, we're, we're all in this together. Let's all, let's, let's all rise and fall together. Yeah. Well, do you see any any prospect of a reform on that? Well, there hasn't been one for the past 20, 30 years, so uh, it's not going to end anytime soon, but, you know, we can chip away at it. And um, uh, th that's that's kind of one of the things that I, I'm worried about, because, uh, as you know, Sylvia Luke, uh, chair of the House Finance Committee, uh, has been relentlessly ch chipping away at special funds, but she ain't going to be there anymore. Hmm. After after the, after this next election, there will be a new finance chair. And this bill that we're talking about, what is it, uh, twenty three seventy nine? Um, it actually, in in its own way, confirms the special fund system, doesn't it? Sure does. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's basically you know Department of Taxation saying, well you know you buggers all have one, so I want one too, which is which is not an unreasonable way of thinking. And and it's something that I would expect from Isaac Troy being a former legislator. Um, you know, he wants to get, you know, what he can for his department, and I don't blame him for that at all. Yeah, but it doesn't sound it doesn't sound healthy to me. Yeah, yeah but for overall government health, it's not good. Yeah. Well, okay. So here we are. Um, uh, the bills are the con the conference committees are done. Uh, the bills are passed or not. Uh, awaiting uh, veto practice. Uh, what's the calendar look like and what's our next discussion going to be about, Tom? Well, the next uh, important day on the calendar is, I believe, June 27th, which is the, uh, was it the 29th? June 29th, the, the date of uh, notice of intent to veto. 
So the governor has to, to let us know uh, by that date uh, if there's going to be any uh, bills that uh, are on his um, list. If, if there is uh, any bill that is not on the list, it's going to become law. And if it is on the list, can he change his mind? Yes, he can. But if it isn't on the list, he can't. It'll be become law. Later. Yep. Cannot. That's right. He's done. He's done. So if, if, if you're a, a KG fellow, then you put things on the veto list, uh, which you may or may not veto. That's right. And, and that, you know, is supposed to um, begin a discussion with the legislative heads on, uh, you know, how, how um, uh, firm they are on getting a certain measure passed. Uh, you know, if, you know, if, if there's A, B, C, and D on the, on the, on the veto, potential veto list, and, you know, supposedly, you know, Scott Sykes, you or Ron Koji can call the governor up the next day and say, well, look, uh, you know, if you, uh, if you, if you veto bill number C, uh, then I guarantee you there's going to be an override session. Mm -hmm. What about uh, the possibility of changes in the course of the uh, veto practice? Is it possible uh, that's, to get it's, a all, it's, it's, it's also possible. Uh, bills can be amended uh, after a veto by the governor to, to meet the governor's objections. Uh, if uh, if they are so amended, they can. They just need to pass one reading in each uh, the House and the Senate. Then it goes back to the governor with the corrections. You know, there's this thing called the biennium. My guess would be, not knowing more about it, my guess would be that the biennium ends, uh, the the end of the two year period ends this year. That's that's uh, correct. So, what does that mean in terms of the legacy of bills that that haven't been treated? They're not automatically carried over. You start completely fresh. In 2023, that's correct. You, you, you start the slate over in 2023. Uh, there's, of course, nothing that that uh, you know prohibits people from using copy and paste uh, and and putting stuff into a uh, from from an old bill into an to a new one, and that's what happens uh, all the time. But uh, uh, the uh, biennium was adopted for fiscal purposes, also it's in our constitution, and uh, it has. You know, budgeting and uh, um, and and yeah, you know, as, as a practical matter, it's it's the end of a representative's uh, term. All representatives have to go have to go uh, stand for re-election every two years. Yeah, uh, re-election thing, as you mentioned, uh, tends to affect the legislation in that last year for sure. Yes. Um, so, uh, last question is this: uh, um, You know, all that we've discussed over the last several weeks, you know, during the session, and of course, uh, some of the bills here, um, looking back on, you know, whether they're mm, questionable or not. Um, how do you rate this session? How do you rate the tenor and time of this session? Uh, would you say it was inspired or otherwise? Well, um, I, I think it was, um, Maybe a little bit less activity than uh, than other sessions. Um, uh, there was a lot less bad stuff um, to to get you know worried and excited about. Um, there were sessions where, you know, I had no nights and weekends uh, because we were constantly reacting to stuff. This this was not one of them. But and so uh, you know, uh, good. <laughs> <laughs> we we need something like that every once in a while. Otherwise, you know, uh, otherwise people like me could you know kick the bucket really easily. <laughs> we don't want that. And Tom, you know, we'll have a new governor soon, and uh, who knows uh, who that might be? Uh, there are guesses uh, going which way. But um, query: How much effect does the governor have on the sessions now to follow? Uh, is it is it a remarkable? Are remarkable changes possible in terms of the legislation that comes out of the legislature because of the governor or the leadership or otherwise? Well, it's always a, an interesting dynamic. You have uh, the executive who's headed, executive branch who's headed by the governor, and you have the legislative leaders. Um, I think a, a lot is going to depend on how well they uh, do or do not get along. Uh, and uh, if there are any common goals for advancing uh, the welfare of the state. Hmm. 
So at the end of the day, the quality of the uh, legislative process and outcome depends on how well they're getting along. I think that's correct. Ah, I think it's human nature. I think it's human nature. <laughs> it's the reality. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Tom. Tom Yamachika, President of the Tax Foundation of Hawaii, uh, helping us understand what goes on in tax and in legislation on tax. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me on the show. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.